Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Carnegie Historical Museum for another monthly program. Today we're going to have a program on historic firearms. Some of them were um, from our collection here in, at the museum, but many of the ones that we have today are, are uh, various pieces that have been uh, not really donated to the museum, but no, donated for our use today anyway. And uh, we have a number of people who have brought uh, different firearms up, and we'll be talking about them and uh, uh, the progression of firearms through history. Today our program is going to be Fred Flinchbaugh, a member of our board, uh, Mike Cornelius, a Fairfield resident that um, does a lot of hunting and, and does firearm work and also does some uh, instruction uh, on safety to uh, students and others, and Keith Schaefer, another Fairfield resident that uh, many of you know. So to start the program for today, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Keith Schaefer. Mm -hmm. Keith? I'm going to read here an introduction from the book Antique Guns by Hank Bowman. No single invention has had so great an effect on the world's pattern as gunpowder and the development of the gun. Granted, it has been the weapon of the assassin, the crutch of the robber and thug, and the muscle of the bully nation. There has also been the key that unlocked serfdom's door for the common man, the tool of the pioneer, and the implement of liberty. Just as it has been a menace in the hands of the criminal, so has it been the criminal's undoing, the instrument of justice in the hands of law enforcement. Then I have a letter here that a Tory wrote in 1775 to his people back in England from Pennsylvania. This province has raised 1,000 riflemen, the worst of whom will put a rifle ball into a man's head at 150 or 200 yards. Therefore, advise your officers who shall hereafter come out to America to settle their affairs out to America to settle their affairs in England before their departure. Mm -hmm. Now that might be just a slight exaggeration, but if uh, you know the trajectory of your weapon, those uh, uh, muzzle loaders of a rifle were quite accurate mm -hmm. as compared to the British smoothbore that would be lucky to hit a man 60 yards. Uh, I might mention also uh, that as a tool, we still use our weapons as a, as a tool. For example, the DNR is trying to use it as a tool to uh, keep the deer population within uh, bounds. Since we don't have cougars and bears and mm -hmm. wolves and Indians uh, to uh, help keep a balance. Uh, incidentally, I read not long ago on some of this research that uh, uh, an a expert, I guess, uh, figured that the Woodland Indians needed an uh, average of four and three tenths deer a person to survive through the year for their food and, and clothing. Okay. I guess I'm next. I've uh, worked up a little uh, introduction to uh, firearms for the uh, hunter safety for the kids we help uh, put through hunter safety for the state and I'd like to go through that for you. Uh, starting with the invention of black powder uh, I like to get the crowd involved, so uh, does anybody know who invented black powder? China. The Chinese, in about the 13th century, we wow. think that the uh, Chinese invented black powder. It's not a written in stone, but that's the best we can come up with. Uh, for a long time, they probably just used it for uh, entertainment, fireworks, and stuff like that. But in the 1500s, uh, we found what we could probably call the first weapons, which was nothing more than a club with a hole drilled down it and a touch hole at the back. They would pour the raw crude black powder down <laughs> there and they'd just pour rocks or <coughs> chunks of wrought iron down the barrel and then take a paper wad and stuff it down there to hold it all in, point it out and either touch a uh, a hot wire or a burning stick to the back of it to make it explode and propel the projectile out the end of it. They've also found, uh, I don't know if any of you know what a pike is, it's just uh, like a metal spear end with a uh, hook like hatchet affair on the end of it. They found some of those that were made into guns. So once you fired them, you had a weapon to use after you fired it because they were real hard to reload. Uh, some of the things muzzle loaders have been called. Of course, they load from the barrel end 
is uh, black powder guns, fire sticks, smoke poles, the Indians call them, a uh, charcoal burner. Uh, Clarence Traw got me started about 26 years ago, and he always called them a charcoal burner. Because mm -hmm. if anybody has ever fired one, the, the, the two main ingredients of black powder are charcoal and sulfur. And if you've ever fired one, you'll know that uh, because the sulfur, sulfur smell is really bad. I know when I first got mine, uh, when I was first married, I tried uh, bringing it in the house to clean it <laughs> and in our old claw foot bathtub. Well, I wanted to keep my wife, so I went out in the garage to clean it from then on. She didn't uh, care for that too much. And then, um, stand up here. Then we get to what we could, uh, we would recognize as a weapon and uh, no comments about my craftsmanship. I just kind of worked this mock up up. Uh, a matchlock. Now, when our forefathers first come to this country, this is what they had. You've probably seen pictures in the history books. Uh, they would usually have a, a long gun and a metal rod, forked rod they carried with them. They'd stick the rod in the ground and then they would stick the matchlock on that to, to help hold it. And the reason was there was so much involved with firing this thing. They really didn't have a hammer and a trigger as we know it today. And the reason I made this up was to show what a serpentine was. It's pretty ingenious and simple. You just pull on the back of it and lower the wick down into the touch hole that ignited the black powder and pro propelled the projectile out the end of the barrel. Now these wicks or matches were made out of either hemp or cotton and they were first soaked in wine or saltpeter and then let to dry. And the reason for that was that that would help them smolder longer so they, they would stay lit. Usually when I do this for the kids, I pour some powder out of a 22 shell in here and then light the, the wick and lower it down in there and show them how hard it is to get that stuff to ignite. But you can imagine the uh, trying to sneak up on a deer or a turkey <laughs> with that thing stinking and smoking. There's, uh, you had to keep these lit quite a bit. There were very few battles ever fought with them and you, they'd have guys, their only job would be run up and down the line at, with uh, a torch or something to keep the, the uh, men's uh, matches or wicks lit. Uh, there are a few uh, documented cases in the early days of the pilgrims that uh, in the forts when they'd have church, the guys, if they thought any, they were going to have any trouble with the Indians or anything, they would leave these things burning and they had big iron rods, hooks off of the wall that they would hang these in to keep them away from the wood, but yet they'd be ready to go. Mm -hmm. And the documented cases is that the women said, no, you're not bringing them in here, take them outside. Mm -hmm. So you can see how wind and rain and, and trying to sneak up on something with a match lock would uh, be very hard to do. Excuse me, Mike. Incidentally, yeah. the Pilgrims had 90 uh, muskets and 10 fowling pieces originally. Yeah, and uh, you can see that the Indians weren't underarmed. They could probably have uh, a half a dozen arrows in the air by the time a guy would get one of those fired and get to the next one. So yeah. we were really in trouble the first few years. They didn't uh, have to stand up to reload either. No. <laughs> and they could, if you were laying behind a log or a tree, they could shoot an arrow over it, which a white, white man couldn't do. Uh, the next thing we come to is a wheel lock. A uh, wheel lock looked uh, much the same as match lock, but by then we had a uh, trigger. We didn't have a hammer then. I'd like to get this, uh, the flint lock here, Keith. Watch that thing, it's really short. The match lock had the regular barrel and stock affair, and they had a trigger. Uh, you won't see a match lock or a wheel lock anywhere <coughs> in a large museum because they're large museum pieces. They're, uh, you know, like 400 years old. Uh, but the way a wheel lock worked was they had a, a wheel made out of uh, serrated metal and a piece of iron pyrite. And when they had a little crank back here, like a, a watchmaker would make the mechanism for the action. The action is the part that fires and loads or ejects the, uh, the means by which the firearm is, is used. 
and you'd wind it up, and then when you press the trigger, it worked just like a modern day cigarette lighter. You have a wheel and a flint, and it, it threw sparks down into the touch hole, which set off the powder and pro propelled the uh, projectile out the end of the barrel. But these were very complicated to make and almost impossible to fix unless you had a forge and stuff. Of course, everybody was rural back then. And they, like I say, they were expensive, so they were still looking for something a little bit better than that. And that's when we come to the flintlock. This, this piece right here is a flintlock. I'll take that off for a minute to show you. Uh, these were uh, real reliable to a point. The wind and rain still would get to them. When you cocked the hammer, you took some real fine granulated black powder and put in what's called the pan. This little section here is like a little bitty spoon. You pour that in there, you pull the frizzen back, which is this piece of metal here, and in this little jaw, if you can see that, you wrap a piece of leather around a piece of flint, and when you pull the trigger, that flint would come down and hit that frizzen, this, this rotating piece here, a glancing blow, which would send a shower of sparks down into the pan, which would ignite the fine black powder, which would go through the touch hole, ignite the black powder, and the bullet or whatever would come out. And these were in use a long time, really, and really, real reliable, unless it was uh, windy or rainy, and then you'd still have a problem trying to keep the action part covered to keep the uh, wind and rain out of there. Um, really, most of these muzzle loaders were very powerful and very accurate. Even the modern day target shooters have only improved on what the muzzle loader could do by fractions of an inch until you get up to extreme long ranges. And about every animal on the planet has been killed by a muzzleloader. They would, they would just make the muzzleloader bigger and throw a heavier piece of lead. Modern uh, cartridge guns can throw their bullets faster, but uh, the old muzzleloaders would uh, use up to a two ounce lead slug to shoot elephants. They had like uh, six bore guns shoulder fired that they would shoot elephants with. So you're not underpowered with a muzzle loader. This is my uh, reproduction percussion muzzle loader. This is what we come to next in the uh, 1600s. Uh, a percussion or cap lock muzzle loader was invented, I believe, by a pastor who was a waterfowler and he, if you've ever hunted ducks, you know it's always windy and rainy when you, when you go to hunt ducks. So he wanted something better, and what brought the percussion gun about was the invention of mercury of fulminite, which is a compound that is very explosive, more so than black powder. And it was just a little tin cup, and you put a few drops of this stuff down in there and let it dry and you'd slip it onto what's called a nipple, which is this little protrusion here. And when you pull the trigger, just the falling of the hammer that crushed that little uh, brass or copper cup would throw hot sparks right into the barrel. You didn't have a touch hole anymore. You had a direct route right into the back of the powder charge. And these things are real reliable. I've killed six or eight deer with this one myself. I've never recovered a bullet. And uh, they're real humane. They, uh, they do a really good job. I'll go over the parts of one of these for you real quick. Most of them had a patch box on there, which you, you kept uh, uh, little patches to wrap around your lead projectile to help hold it in the barrel because they made the barrels a little bit oversized. If anybody's ever shot uh, black powder, they'll know that besides it smelling like rotten, rotten eggs, <laughs> it, it produces a residue like a black gummy tar, and it does it real quick within a couple shots. So if you made your barrels too tight, you couldn't get another ball rammed down the end of the barrel. So you had to have some patches. 
Could I have my uh, bag down there, Chief? Yeah. Most of the, you have to have a, a whole bunch of stuff to uh, work a muzzle loader because what you're doing is you're actually making your own bullet as you go. I don't have all this stuff out. Uh, if no one has ever seen how you make your own bullets, this is a lead mold. You just pour molten lead, you can melt lead over an open campfire, pour the lead in that little hole, knock that open with a stick, and you open it up, and you'll see the impression of uh, how to make a bullet. This is the mold I make to make bullets for this particular, uh, pass that around if you want to, uh, gun. I might mention, Mike, that uh, the uh, smooth bores work all as a disadvantage because they're, they're so much easier and quicker to load yeah. because they didn't have a rifle. You, uh, if, in the movies, if you've ever seen the, uh, the troops in the Civil War would, would take something out of their pocket and bite on it, that was a paper-wrapped cartridge. They were starting to uh, compartmentalize all their stuff and uh, before brass cartridges, they would take the bullet and the powder and put the powder down and then the bullet and they would roll that paper up like a cigar and twist each end of it so they had their powder and ball in that paper cartridge. They'd take it out, bite the end of it off, pour the powder down the end of the uh, barrel and then they'd just take the paper which acted as the wadding and the bullet, push it down with the uh, ramrod. There, there are a lot of uh, phrases today still associated with firearms. <laughs> I just, I wrote down a few. Uh, they say somebody has a hair trigger. You know, we all know what a hair trigger is on a firearm. Uh, ramrod, the, what you use to push the bullet down the barrel with. They say some guy's a ramrod, a real pusher. Uh, loose cannon. Uh, a dud, it just, there's dozens of, of uh, the nomenclature for- Flash in the pan. <laughs> flash in the pan, that's when the, your flint would come down on your flint lock. You'd have a big flash, but it didn't set any powder off in the barrel. Keep there, your powder dry. Keep your powder dry. <laughs> there's one here I can't quite verify, but I, I've heard it several times, the whole nine yards. Does anybody mm -hmm. know where yeah. that come from? No. <laughs> They claim that's how long a machine gun belt in World War I was, was uh, 27 feet long. I give him the whole nine yards. Oh. I, I can't verify that, but it sounded good to me. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> Just uh, prior to the Civil War period, I believe it was the British, let me see the one with the bayonet key decided not only to have an offensive weapon, the gun, but as soon as they fired the gun, if they couldn't get it fired quick enough, they had a defensive weapon. They took the knife, which is always loaded, never runs out. You took it and put it on the rifle, and you had a very long spear. Uh, I believe the British the, that first started this practice just had a wooden handle on their what's called a bayonet and you just jammed it to the end of the barrel and that didn't work out too good because if you used it a lot of times it would get stuck in there and you couldn't take it off. <laughs> so they have, uh, over the years a lot of different countries have devised many different methods for sticking a bayonet onto a rifle. Well, that kind of covers the black powder era. Uh, we, we get into right at the Civil War period where they start to uh, make cartridges or brass case uh, bullets for firearms, but they still use black powder. Smokeless powder hadn't been invented yet. And uh, I think it may have been Smith and Wesson, I'm not sure about this. They took the little cap I was telling you about that was uh, full of uh, mercury fulminite 
and they were playing around. They took a little lead BB, like a, a 22 size uh, lead pellet, and they stuck it in the end of that little cap, mm -hmm. and they were playing with it. And they shoot, we got everything here to make a cartridge that's self contained. So, actually, that's kind of how uh, the brass cartridges got started. The uh, black, like I say, black powder was still in use. They still had the fouling and buildup problem. Uh, one thing I'd probably be remiss in, in not talking about before I get done here is uh, gun handling and safety. And the, the first thing we do with any firearm when we pick it up is uh, keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. You, you've got to make quite a few mistakes to do something wrong with a firearm, contrary to popular belief. Uh, you have to, to cover the muzzle with something that can be destroyed. You don't want to point it at or move it across anything you don't want to destroy. That's number one. That's something we, we drum into the kids uh, at our hunter safety courses. Time and again, in the three days that we have and the 10 hours that we, we put them through the course, is point the muzzle in a safe direction. Then you have to have your firearm loaded. You have to have the action closed on it. You have to have the safety off if it's working or it has one. And you have to put your finger inside the trigger guard. Then you have to pull the trigger. I mean, it's, uh, there is a series of things that you have to do to get a firearm to discharge. But all, if you do them all wrong except for one thing, if you keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction, you're not going to hurt anything or anyone. Now, like I say, they, they, uh, right during the Civil War, a little after they come up with uh, the brass cartridge, they had the uh, cap or primer in the back of it. And they had the metal case that contained the, the uh, black powder, and they had the bullet. And uh, most of the guns you'll see of that period that's, that were a cartridge gun that still shot black powder had two designations. Like uh, Judge Robinson has brought us in here a, uh, a gun from uh, the Custer area, era. That's actually Civil War. Yeah. Civil War. Okay. It went through the Civil War. Yeah. Oh, this one did. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, this one is the paper patch, but uh, they were called a 4570. I don't know whether this one's 4570 caliber. No, that's a 50. 54, 52. Uh, but you'll have two designations on them. Like a 4570 would be a 45 caliber bullet, and the 70 meaning how many grains of black powder was shot in. So a lot of times when you see these older guns, they'll have two designations. Actually, the 3030 that, that a lot of people know about started out as a black powder cartridge. It had a 30 caliber bullet with 30 grains of black powder in it. Uh, I don't know whether the judge is going to talk about some of these or not. Uh, I want to show a, a World War I piece here. This is a, a cartridge gun of 30-06 caliber. This is one that uh, our boys took to uh, World War I. It's called a bolt action gun, meaning this being the bolt, you ran the bullet up in and turned it down to lock it in there. These were very strong and very reliable. This is actually kind of a modified Mauser action. And the German Mauser is probably the, the father or the grandfather of all modern bolt action rifles. They're very strong, very reliable, and this is the kind of weapon that we took into World War I. I believe Alvin York, if anybody knows their history, uh, Alvin York shot a, uh, a Springfield like this, which is a, a predecessor of this particular piece. And he did very well with it, too. The, uh, I, I think those, 
I don't know whether the, were those taken into the uh, the Mexican American incursion. Uh, no, the the O threes showed up. Well, yeah, they probably did make the in, into either that or the Craig Jorgensen. Yeah. But uh, well, now the Craig Jorgensen went into Cuba with these truck yeah. drivers. But uh, when Black Jack Pershing went down to Mexico to deal with uh, Pancho Villa, who was trying to, to uh, start a new government in Mexico, there was actually one case of Pancho Villa's men coming into the United States, crossing the border into a small town, and that was the first time the machine gun was used against mounted troops with bold actions, and they found out real quick that uh, you, you don't charge machine guns. I think <laughs> we lost seven men and they lost 144 and they had a hard time cleaning the horses out of Main Street of that little town down in Mexico. Uh, I just I want to show you one uh, World War I piece here that I have that uh, is kind of unique. This is a revolver that we took into uh, World War I. It, it was unique in that it used an automatic uh, pistol type cartridge uh, and it was in a, a moon clip, they called it. You just clip the bullets into it, and you could pull this out of your pouch, drop it into the cylinder, close it and fire it, and when you opened it up to eject it and punched it, they all come out at once. Hmm. So that was kind of a unique feature. And also around the World War I era, the, uh, what was later become known as the 1911 Colt or a semi-automatic pistol. They were actually called a 1903 or 1905 at the time. <laughs> uh, come out was the semi-automatic semi pistol. Semi-automatic meaning each time you press the trigger around is fired. Automatic means like a machine gun, you press the trigger and it just keeps shooting till it goes dry. The manner in which this operated was you had a, a, a magazine full of bullets. You just keep pushing them in there and about eight of them will go down in there or seven. You slip it up into the gun and it's recoil operated. Every time that you fired it, the recoil of the gun would blow a spring actuated heavy slide backwards like that, fling the empty out that had just been fired and then it would strip a new one out of your magazine that raised to the top, and it would do that every time you press the trigger until it went dry, and then it would hold it open. Most semi-automatics are re either recoil operated or gas operated. Uh, this one happens to be a recoil operated uh, Browning design. Something I didn't cover in the black powder here before I quit, and I'd like to, is explosive properties of uh, black powder. Black powder, you could just pour a little pile of it out here on the table and light it with a match. It will blow up on you. It explodes. Modern smokeless powder burns. Uh, during our hunter safety course, I'll take a little uh, smokeless powder and pour it in a mayonnaise jar lid or something right there on a the table and then light it with a match and it'll just burn up and then go right back down. When it is not confined, it doesn't explode. It just burns. But it, it gets complicated with ballistics. Black powder will explode, but it explodes at a less violent rate than smokeless powder burns. But beware of black powder. It is very dangerous. Most all of the black powder plants we've had in this country are gone. They're big holes in the ground. Mm -hmm. Even some of the modern high-tech black powder plants that we have uh, made in the last hundred years are gone. You just can't keep that stuff stable. They make something now called, it's a synthetic black powder called Pyrodex. It's so safe you can ship it UPS. Now, some of the guys that are real purists say that black powder shoots a little better than, than Pyrodex, but for the few fractions of an inch, even if it does, it's not worth the trouble. Uh, I saw the judge brought in a powder flask here. When you're uh, putting black powder into a uh, black powder firearm, never take a big amount like this and pour it directly into the barrel, because if the barrel is hot, or you have some other problem, 
it'll explode up into this container and the mortician will have fun putting you back together when this much black powder goes off. Uh, shock and heat can set off black powder. It's just about anything. Do you know why uh, they never made any metal powder flasks? They had brass, copper, horn. This one is a nice walnut one. Uh, and uh, even ivory. Yeah. Static electricity. And mm -hmm. iron will conduct a little static electricity. It will set off black powder. It is very dangerous. So. If, if I were you, I would use the Pyrodex. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are going to uh, cover some of the World War II guns or not. Are you going to, Fred? Uh, just the uh, carbine. Just the carbine. Uh, might, yeah. men might mention, uh, Bob, do you want to re relate on uh, Custer's problems with his uh, sticking uh, yes, cartridges? Custer. Custer used the trapdoor like, like this one. It was in .45-70 caliber. The only thing was that the ones that Custer used were smaller. They were carbines. But the problem didn't lie so much in the gun. The gun was all right. But the cartridge that they used was a problem. And it was a problem because it was made out of copper, almost pure copper. Well, the gun functioned fine if you fired it one or two times. But over a period of time, it got hot in that cartridge, which I have some of. As it got hot and that cartridge would begin to stick, the ejector on this gun would extract, would extract that cartridge out on the side. But this soft copper, it wouldn't extract it. It would just break the side out of that shell and uh, not remove the shell. So the troops were sitting there on the battlefield with the uh, cleaning rods and punching those shots out as the engines were lifting the shells up. They later turned to this brass cartridge and that solved the problem. And I've fired this old trap there many times with the brass cartridge and don't have any problem with it. But certainly with the copper one, if you fire it five or six times, you will have a problem with it. Is that? Yes, I, there, there are a lot of things that we don't see in the history book that have quite an effect on history. Uh, for example, uh, Napoleon, uh, the Battle of Waterloo, many uh, experts say that one of the things that did him in was a sunken road that he didn't realize that his cavalry uh, charged over and, and they uh, fell into this ditch. But also, uh, maybe even a more effect on his loss was the fact that he had a lot of rain and he couldn't get his artillery in position. And incidentally, uh, he learned his tactics from Gustavus Adolphus, an earlier general from the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but, uh, he covered some of their uh, tactics as far as artillery is concerned. There's an old adage in the infantry, and I'm sure every infantryman here has heard it before. You never work outside of your artillery. Never work outside of the range of your artillery. Mm -hmm. Right. You stop. Let your artillery move up. <clears throat> One thing I'd like to mention on firearms is uh, the artistry. Some of us think that firearms are uh, a beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, also, the engineering of firearms. There's just so many fascinating action types and, and the way firearms are uh, put together and how they function. A lot of engineer, uh, ingenious engineers have uh, designed many different ways to make firearms. Uh, it's not only some of us redneck hunters that have an appreciation for firearms. A lot of uh, doctors and lawyers and presidents have uh, had a real love affair with firearms. Uh, I've known several pa pastors that's had some real nice collections. Uh, at our local club, we do a lot of uh, paper shooting, so it's, it's not all just the crazies that misuse firearms that, uh, that we see. Uh, and in manufacturing, one of the, uh, the copy lathe, for instance, was uh, designed by a gunsmith to take the labor intensiveness out of making wooden stocks for firearms. It took five <coughs> hours to fit and make wooden stocks, so he designed a copy lathe, which you would take a one wooden stock you had made, it had, would have finger followers on it, 
and you could put another stock of or a wooden blank or board over here or maybe a whole gang of them you turn the machine on and it would carve these other ones off of the first copy that you put in so there we have the copy lathe and also different tools to bore a long straight hole and uh, the interchangeability of parts would mostly come about by uh, firearms engineers. It was a real problem in the early days. Most all handguns or uh, firearms were handmade. And if you broke a piece on this particular uh, percussion or flintlock rifle, you had to go to a forge or a blacksmith, somebody to get that piece made to fit on there. Well, when they began to making parts so precise they could make them identical, when somebody in battle would break a part, all they would have to do is run to the back of the line, get another part for that firearm, slip in it, and he was ready to go again. So manufacturing and engineering has, has, has gained a lot from firearms. Uh, one, one nomenclature I, I'd like to uh, bring up is, is uh, lock, stock, and barrel, that saying. You, of course, you have the stock, which is the wooden part, the uh, lock or action, which is how a gun functions and fires, and the barrel, of course. And uh, the, you've heard the expression, I'll just take it lock, stock, and barrel. Mm -hmm. Well, in the early days, uh, you had a metal smith or a blacksmith who made the barrel, and maybe you had a, somebody that had clock making experience who made the action or lock part for the in intricacy and the spring making, and then you had a, a carpenter or cabinetry man who usually made stocks. Well, you just didn't run over and buy a gun. You went down and you got a stock, and you went to the barrel make maker and got a barrel, and you went to another guy that made the, the action or the lock, and, and as the manufacturing progressed, and a guy could make the whole gun himself, then you go in and you just say, give me the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, Eli Whitney is credited for mass production, the start of mass production. But in the 1790s, Congress did something right. They uh, had a, made a, a firearms order and they decreed that the, a lot of the pieces be interchangeable. Yeah. Well, I think I'm done. All right. Well, I... Uh, want to uh, show a couple items here first and then I'm going to get into a little common sense safety around the home. This one right here, Keith, if I can lift it. <laughs> um, this one is a, a Fairfield made gun. Whoops, I'm going to get into the mic there a bit. Um, this is a Burkett rifle and it's a percussion cap rifle and so uh, you can watch this one here is also a burkett I'll put them both together you can look at them if we got the room there we go uh, afterwards uh, see the similarities and differences but many times in those days as Mike was saying uh, probably burkett bought this barrel from someone ready-made and then he made the action and the stock for it. But uh, it's interesting to note them both that there are differences in the guns, like they possibly had been made for the prospective owner uh, who specified something different than the owner before him. Uh, another thing I want to point out from World War II, which of course I date a little earlier than uh, some of you, but uh, this was one that after World War II I was uh, familiar with because uh, the 34th Infantry Division Band, of which I was a member for 12 years, carried the M1 carbine. And uh, we had quite a problem at that time. I'll just relate a few things to you. As you notice, we have the actions open on these guns. You can see the, not only the chamber, 
but that the uh, uh, clip is empty. Um, we tried to fire, each fire our own guns. Some of them were machine guns and would empty the clip. <laughs> you were just uh, in a split second, and um, others wouldn't fire at all, and uh, so we had quite a time. But uh, the band finally got about uh, seven or eight or nine guns that were pretty decently accurate and would fire out of the bunch. And so we all qualified with those. And uh, I was lucky enough to qualify as a marksman the uh, first time out. And the, in three years when I went back to qualify, I was lucky enough to become a uh, sharpshooter. I never did make the uh, uh, expert range, but uh, anyway, two out of three ain't bad, I guess. Um, I want to talk a little bit about safety of guns in and around the home. We've heard several things lately about children and guns, and uh, one of the things that I like to bring out is uh, where were the parents when the children had guns? But uh, this seems to be the way. The parents are working, they're busy, they're gone. And uh, so I think gun security in the home is absolutely paramount. Uh, children should be taught that if they see a gun anywhere, whether it's concealed somewhere, maybe laying on the ground or in the street or any place else to run and tell the nearest adult that they can trust that uh, there is a gun and something should be done about it. Um, the children uh, with adult supervision can uh, learn about guns so that they're not a big curiosity. They can uh, fire them under adult supervision and uh, learn um, to be accurate. I know uh, this is one of the things that helped me. I had a BB gun when I was a kid and learned how to fire it. Uh, but um, anyway, I feel that that uh, is a paramount thing. Uh, Mike brought out the fact that uh, the basic rule, keep the muzzle, doesn't matter whether it's a handgun, a uh, long rifle, shotgun, whatever, in a direction that will not uh, destroy anyone or anything that you don't want destroyed. Um, the uh, other thing that I'd like to bring out, um, we go through the family, we'll go to the wife. We've heard quite a bit about battered wives anymore and the fact that Battered wives uh, sometimes decide that they don't want to be battered anymore and they start packing a pistol. Well, uh, there's a many things that gun ownership, the responsibility of gun ownership should be uh, brought out. I don't have time here today to go through them all, but uh, most certainly there are courses for this. Um, this brings up a question of should there be a loaded gun in the house? And most certainly there should not. Um, I feel very strongly about that. But uh, here you will have the wife who says, well, I um, am going to have to use a gun quickly if I use it. What can be done? In most cases, there's always a solution. In this case, you'll probably have some kind of a handgun and there are safes available now that have a braille type uh, combination on them so they can even be opened in the dark. And under this circumstance, I suppose you could keep a loaded gun in the house, but naturally the combination should not go beyond her own mind so that uh, most certainly the children or anyone else would not know this combination. We come to the man of the house. He's traditionally been head of the household. And yet, um, how does he defend himself if he wishes to use a gun? Or uh, is it necessary to use a gun? Well, 
Uh, as Mike's pointed out, uh, knives are always loaded, always ready. I personally happen to have as my first line of defense a um, lead-weighted cane and a baseball bat. <laughs> now I do have, since I'm a farmer, uh, have a chance where somebody might be out uh, side and I wonder what's going on. I do have a 12-gauge um, shotgun, but I would use this in a different way than you might think. Uh, I would go outside with my cell phone and uh, I would uh, very carefully uh, go around to the front of the automobile that they're going to use for escape and discharge a couple shells into the radiator. At such time, uh, I would disappear back into the shadows, since this is probably after dark, we're talking, and call on the cell phone, 911, waiting for the police, and I will tell them which way they go from my farm, north or south, and they look for an overheating car. Now this is my thought on it. And other ideas can be made that are equally, or even more so, a uh, craft that uh, would not endanger anyone's life. I feel very strongly that human life today is far too precious that uh, we cannot in any way let uh, firearms um, interfere with our living and uh, actually became, become an unsafe object. Um, with perseverance, with common sense, firearms can be used in a safe manner. And uh, anybody else got anything? How about uh, the audience? I'd like to interject. Sure. One thing you were talking about qualifying with firearms. When you reach 16 years on active duty in the military, you fire for the last time for qualification. Whatever your score is at that time, that's recorded in your service record as being your, the score that you fire. From that time on, you still fire a firearm, but you wouldn't have to fire for qualification. When I reached 16 <coughs> years, <clears throat> I fired the 45 for that day. I had never been able to hit anything with a 45 caliber pistol. But on that day, it seemed like everything I pointed to that, I hit. The total score that you get was 36. I got 34. If you look at my service record today, you find that I'm an expert with a 45. <laughs> I couldn't get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, uh -huh. far as, uh, far as uh, firearm safety, uh, one of the things I feel, I have two young children, uh, 10 and 12 years old. I believe ignorance is one of the biggest problems you can have. Uh, Any time they want to look at a firearm I own, all they know all they have to do is come to me, whether I want to or not, and I will show them a firearm and how it operates. If they are totally ignorant of how it operates, they're, if they do get their hands on it, they're going to they're gonna have a problem. I believe, as well as Fred does, there is no excuse ever for having a loaded firearm in the house. Uh, if you have to do it so fast with, uh, to get a hold of one that quickly, you probably didn't have time to uh, get it anyway. You should allow yourself a little time at least to, to load it to get your head clear, especially if, you, if you've been uh, woken up or something. Uh, something the experts uh, all agree on nowadays is having a safe room in the house. And basically uh, what this consists of that is that will be a room that has a telephone in it, or where you go with your cell phone. And to make it a safe room, you, you get a solid core door, a solid wooden door instead of a hollow core door. And if you put two locks on a solid core door, I don't care how big this guy is, if the locks have been uh, put on properly, he is going to have one heck of a time not only trying to break through it, you can't, you can't even shoot the lock off of these things, a, a solid core very quickly. So you'd have plenty of time to call and in my own opinion I would never go looking for an intruder. I would get to my kids or my wife and if they weren't there I would just sit down in the corner somewhere. All hunters know you let the animal come to you 
you never go to the animal. He'll hear you or see you first. So if they want to steal anything in the house, as long as it's not your kids and maybe your wife, <laughs> you just uh, sit down and let them take everything in the place. And if they come to this secured room and try to get in, inform them you have a firearm, then it's their decision whether they want to live or die. An example of familiarity with firearms, a while back there was a shooting in a school and when the uh, student had emptied his weapon, one of the other students that was a hunter realized how long it would take him to reload, so he tackled him and saved the rest of the kids. If he had not been familiar with firearms, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell how long, that, uh, how many people this uh, yeah. student would have killed. We're always gonna have crazy people in our society and it doesn't matter how many laws or how many, much money you throw at the problem. We're going to have somebody misusing some piece of equipment to disrupt, disrupt society. So, Whenever you have drugs, including alcohol, mm -hmm. there's going to be this problem. So uh, especially we people in the rural area are, feel quite vulnerable because there are, what, 435 square miles in the county. So law enforcement is quite a ways away from us as far as time and distance as compared to some people in town. So, so we feel it's uh, mandatory that we have some of these that we can protect the family. And it, it, it is our right to do so. Uh, one reason we are called citizens and, and not subjects, we're one of the very few countries left on the planet that uh, we give ourselves the right to protect ourselves. We have freedom of speech. Uh, but one of the unique things is, with, is that we can arm ourselves and protect ourselves. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything we've said? Have we said everything right? <laughs> May I make a comment on a couple Here. of these old firearms? Uh, first is, this is an old 1859 Sharp carbine. But the thing that is unique about it is before the Civil War started. This was produced much before the Civil War. And before it started, there was, if you remember, John Brown, the abolitionist. Well, there was a Reverend Beecher who would send the John Brown these rifles in cartons, but on the outside of the cartons, he would mark it Beecher's Bibles. Hmm? Well, all through the Civil War, and ever since then, this rifle has been known as Beecher's, as a Beecher's Bible. <laughs> That's just one piece of history that a lot of people don't know. We want to thank Bob Robinson. He brought a lot of these. Uh, Very nice collection. This old rifle here is the Springfield Trap War. <clears throat> when they, this rifle stayed in the Army inventory longer than any other rifle it was ever carried. When they got ready to get rid of this, they had what they called the Craig Jorgensen, which was a 30 caliber rifle, much smaller cartridge. And the old soldiers at the time looked at that small and that rifle with that small cartridge, <coughs> and they said, that gun will never kill nothing. They didn't want to get rid of this old trap door with the great big cartridge. But as it proved out, uh, with Ted Rose of Albert San Juan Hill, the Craig Jorgensen proved out to be a very effective rifle, in 30 caliber. The reason there were a lot of amputees in the Civil War was because of those big slugs. Yeah. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would remove a section of mm -hmm. leg or arm bone, just take it on out, and there was nothing you Here's could, uh, the like surgeon at that time, could do to repair it. never seen them. These are all Civil War. I might add that um, I think the Civil War is interesting um, war, if you can call war interesting. <laughs> It's been termed hell, which is probably the best bet for it, but uh, it had so many things where advancement of things, uh, of mechanical things, were uh, changed from the front of the war to the back. The uh, a Navy started out with wooden ships, went to steel ships, they went from uh, the old uh, cannons with the uh, powder and ball to rifled um, cannons and um, the uh, arms 
and went from um, smoothbore muskets to rifles to the repeating rifle. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, oh, and many other things. There, there was just quite a difference between 1861 and 1865. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting to me, anyway, to study from that standpoint. One thing I didn't bring out, here's a little dinky cartridge that this M1 carbine fires. And that, that compares to the old Craig Jorgensen round, the, the one that was yeah. 30 caliber round, so you can see the difference inside. They're both 30 caliber. Yeah, yeah. both 30 caliber. Yeah, right. <laughs> much more of a powder charge than one. Yeah. If you folks have a, a uh, interest in firearms, I don't know how many of you have been following on Channel 54, the History Channel, the history of the gun. That about every week they take a different period in history and uh, highlight it. And uh, I think tonight at 8 o'clock on Channel 54, uh, and my uh, period in history is uh, of, of interest to me is the, the old guns of the West is going to be on tonight, so if any of you want to see that. Do you think that in the last 50 years, I mean, you buy a 12 gauge pump or a 22 bolt action, mm -hmm. they haven't changed that much in the last 50 years, have they? I mean, the materials, and maybe are better. That's something I wanted to bring up. From, from your flintlock to modern day, you still have powder, you still have a projectile, you have to sight it and shoot it. What are they working on today? Is it still basically what we've worked on for the last three or four hundred years? The, the one thing I know of, they're working on caseless ammunition. Hmm. It's a hard cake of powder hmm. that is waterproof that just has a bullet stuck on the end of it with a, looks like a little dot in the back. So when you fire it, you would see no cases coming out. Everything would be expelled. When the powder went off, the bullet would go, there'd be nothing to eject, so you wouldn't have to have an ejection problem, only a feeding problem. One other thing that they used in Vietnam was night sights, which is uh, pretty high tech. Our soldiers can fight at night with small arms now. Uh, they don't equip every soldier with a uh, shoulder-fired weapon that has a night sight, but they are working on ways to make one smaller so you can fight at night. And another thing that I, I'm interested in is this uh, new triangulation of fire system they have that will have incoming bullets at you. This thing will read at what angle and where it came from. Mm. So a man, even in the dark, can fire back from where the bullets mm. came from. So they are working on different things, but I don't know if they'll ever get to the point to where you don't have to have a man on the ground with a gun in his hand to go in and solve the problems when it's all said and done. I think we've seen that with uh, Saddam Hussein. You can, you can bomb him until you're out of money, but it still takes men on the ground to go in and risk their lives. Thank you, Mike, and Fred, and Keith, and Bob also, and especially a big thanks to everybody who brought some uh, firearms today to share with everybody. Uh, I'm sure that everybody's here would be welcome to uh, stand around, share some stories, share some uh, facts and things about all these guns and uh, some things that you might have in your, your own collections. So each, uh, each uh, first Sunday of every month, we have a program here at the museum. We invite people to come up. I'm not sure what next month's is. Uh, do you know, Mark? I'm not well, sure. Company, well, we, the first Sunday of each month, we do have a program at 2 o'clock. They are rebroadcast on FPAC. We like to highlight some things that we have in the museum and then have some people in the community share their thoughts and their, uh, their knowledge about those particular things. So we do thank Keith and, and Mike and Bob uh, for doing that today. So for the Fairfield uh, Carnegie Historical Museum, I'm Gene Lutke, and thanks everybody for coming. Mm -hmm.